Welcome to RLP Audiobooks channel, the channel that brings forgotten books back to life, in audio format, so you can listen to whenever and wherever you desire, whether you're driving, chilling, and even sleeping. Please consider subscribing to the channel, and click the notifications button, so you don't miss out on any other videos. Now, relax, listen, ponder, and enjoy. Surah 105. Alfio. The Historical Background. In retaliation for the persecution of the followers of the Prophet Jesus, in Najran, by the Jewish ruler, Zunu Was, of Yemen, the Christian kingdom of Abyssinia invaded Yemen, and put an end to the Himyarite rule there, and in 525 CE, this whole land passed under Abyssinian control. This happened in fact, through collaboration between the Byzantine Empire of Constantinople, and the Abyssinian Kingdom, for the Abyssinians at that time, had no naval fleet. The fleet was provided by Byzantium, and Abyssinia sent 70,000 of its troops by it, across the Red Sea to Yemen. At the outset, one should understand that all this did not happen under the religious zeal, but there were economic, and political factors also working behind it. And probably these were the real motives, and retaliation for the Christian blood was just an excuse. Since the time the Byzantine Empire had occupied Egypt and Syria, it had been trying to gain control over the trade, going on between East Africa, India, Indonesia, etc., and the Byzantine dominions from the Arabs, who had been controlling it for centuries so as to earn maximum profits, by eliminating the intermediary Arab merchants. For this purpose, in 24, or 25 BC, Caesar Augustus sent a large army, under the Roman general, Ilius Gallus, which landed on the western coast of Arabia, in order to intercept and occupy the sea route, between southern Arabia and Syria. But the campaign failed, to achieve its objective on account of the extreme geographical conditions of Arabia. After this, the Byzantines brought their fleet into the Red Sea, and put an end to the Arab trade, which they carried out by sea, with the result, that they were left only with the land route. To capture this very land route, they conspired with the Abyssinian Christians, and aiding them with their fleet helped them to occupy Yemen. The Arab historian's statements about the Abyssinian army that invaded Yemen are different. Hafiz ibn Kathir, says that it was led by two commanders, Aryar, and Abraha, and according to Muhammad bin Ishaq, its commander was Aryar, and Abraha was included in it. They both agree that Aryar, and Abraha fell out. Aryar was killed in the encounter, and Abraha took possession of the country. Then somehow he persuaded the Abyssinian king to appoint him his viceroy over Yemen. On the contrary, the Greek and Syriac historians state, that after the conquest of Yemen, the Abyssinians started putting to death, the Yemenite chiefs, who had put up resistance. One of the chiefs, named Asamafi Ashwa, whom the Greek historians call Asamphaeus, yielded to the Abyssinians and promising to pay tribute, obtained the Abyssinian king's warrant to be governor over Yemen. But the Abyssinian army revolted against him, and made Abraha, governor in his place. This man was the slave of a Greek merchant, of the Abyssinian seaport of Attalus, who by clever diplomacy had come to wield great influence, in the Abyssinian army occupying Yemen. The troops sent by the Negus to punish him, either warned him, or were defeated by him. Subsequently after the death of the king, his successor was reconciled to accept him, as his vicegerent of Yemen. The Greek historians write him as Abrams, and the Syriac historians as Abraham. Abraha, perhaps is an Abyssinian variant of Abraham, for its Arabic version is Ibrahim. This man, through passage of time, became an independent ruler of Yemen. He acknowledged the sovereignty of the Negus, only in name, and described himself as his deputy. The influence he wielded, 
can be judged from the fact that after the restoration of the Dam of Marib, in 543 CE, he celebrated the event by holding a grand feast, which was attended by the ambassadors of the Byzantine Emperor, King of Persia, King of Hera, and King of Ghassan. Its full details are given in the inscription, that Abrahines told on the dam. This inscription is extant, and Glazer has published it. After stabilizing his rule in Yemen, Abraha turned his attention to the objective, which from the very beginning of this campaign, had been before the Byzantine Empire and its allies, the Abyssinian Christians, for example to spread Christianity in Arabia on the one hand, and to capture the trade that was carried out through the Arabs, between the eastern lands, and the Byzantine dominions on the other. The need for this increased, because the Byzantine struggle for power, against the Sasanian Empire of Persia, had blocked all the routes of the Byzantine trade with the east. To achieve this objective, Abraha built, in Sana, the capital of Yemen, a magnificent cathedral, called by the Arabian historians, al khalis al khali or, al khalis this word being an Arabic version of the Greek word, ecclesia, church. According to Muhammad bin Ishaq, after having completed the building, he wrote to the Negus, saying, I shall not rest until I have diverted the Arabs' pilgrimage to it." Ibn Kathir, writes, that he openly declared his intention in Yemen, and got it publicly announced. He in fact, wanted to provoke the Arabs into doing something which should provide him with an excuse, to attack Mecca, and destroy the Kaaba. Muhammad bin Ishaq, says that an Arab, enraged at this public proclamation, somehow went into the cathedral, and defiled it. Ibn Kathir says, this was done by a Qurayshite, and according to Makadal bin Suleiman, some young men of the Quraysh, had set fire to the cathedral. Either might have happened, for Abraha's proclamation was certainly provocative, and in the ancient pre-Islamic age, it cannot be impossible that an Arab, or a Quraishite youth, might have been enraged, and might have defiled the cathedral, or set fire to it. Whatever happened, when the report reached Abraha, that the devotees of the Kaaba, had thus defiled his cathedral, he swore that he would not rest until he had destroyed the Kaaba. So in 570, or 571 CE, he took 60,000 troops and 13 elephants, according to another tradition, 9 elephants, and set off for Mecca. On the way, first, a Yemeni chief, Zunafr, by name, mustering an army of the Arabs, resisted him, but was defeated and taken prisoner. Then in the country of Kathtam, he was opposed by Nufail bin Habib al-Kathtam, with his tribe, but he too was defeated, and taken prisoner, and in order to save his life, he accepted to serve him as guide, in the Arab country. When he reached near Taif, Bani Thaqif, felt that they would not be able to resist such a big force, and feeling the danger lest he should destroy the temple of their deity Lot too, their chief Masud, came out to Abraha with his men, and he told him that their temple was not the temple he had come to destroy. The temple he sought was in Mecca, and they would send with him a man to guide him there. Abraha accepted the offer, and Bani Thaqif, sent Abu Rigal, as a guide with him. When they reached Al Mugamis, or Al Mugamis, a place about three miles short of Mecca, Abu Ragal died, and the Arabs stoned his grave, and the practice survives to this day. They cursed the Bani Thaqif too, for in order to save the Temple of Lot, they had cooperated with the invaders of the House of God. According to Muhammad bin Ishaq, from Al Mugamis, Abraha sent forward his vanguard and they brought him the plunder of the people of Tihama, and Quraysh, which included two hundred camels of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Messenger of God. Then he sent an envoy of his, to Mecca, with the message that he had not come to fight the people of Mecca, but only to destroy the house. The Kaaba. If they offered no resistance, there would be no cause for bloodshed. Abraha also instructed his envoy, 
that if the people of Mecca wanted to negotiate, he should return with their leading chief to him. The leading chief of Mecca at that time, was Abdul Muttalib. The envoy went to him, and delivered Abraha's message. Abdul Muttalib replied, We have no power to fight Abraha. This is God's house. If he wills, he will save his house. The envoy asked him, to go with him to Abraha. He agreed, and accompanied him to the king. Now, Abdul Muttalib was such a dignified and handsome man, that when Abraha saw him, he was much impressed. He got off his throne and sat beside him, on the carpet. Then he asked him what he wanted. Abdul Muttalib replied, that he wanted the king to return his camels, which he had taken. Abraha said, I was much impressed when I saw you, but your reply has brought you down. In my eyes, you only demand your camels, but you say nothing about this house, which is your sanctuary, and the sanctuary of your forefathers. He replied, I am the owner of my camels, and am requesting you to return them. As for the house, it has its own owner, he will defend it. When Abraha said, that he would not be able to defend it against him, Abdul Muttalib said, that that rested between him, and him. With this, Abdul Muttalib left Abraha, and he returned to him, his camels. One thing which becomes evident, is that the tribes living in, and around Mecca, did not have the power to fight such a big force, and save the Kaaba. Therefore, obviously the Quraysh did not try to put up any resistance. The Quraysh, on the occasion of the Battle of the Trench, Ahzab, had hardly been able to muster strength, numbering 10 to 12,000 men. In spite of the alliance with the pagan, and Jewish tribes, they could not have resisted an army 60,000 strong. Muhammad bin Ishaq, says that after returning from the camp, of Abraha, Abdul Muttalib ordered the Quraysh to withdraw from the city, and go to the mountains along with their families, for fear of a general massacre. Then he went to the Kaaba, along with some chiefs of the Quraysh, and taking hold of the iron ring of the door, prayed to God Almighty, to protect his house and its keepers. There were at that time, 360 idols in, and around the Kaaba, but on that critical moment, they forgot them, and implored only God for help. Their supplications which have been reported in the books of history, do not contain any name, but of God, the One. Ibn Hisham, in his Life of the Prophet, has cited some verses of Abdul Muttalib, which are to the following effect. O oh God, a man protects his house, so protect your house. Let not their cross and their craft tomorrow, overcome your craft. If you will to leave them, and are Qibla, to themselves, you may do as you please. Suhail and Raud al Nuf has cited this verse also in this connection. Help today, your devotees, against the devotees of the cross, and its worshippers. After making these supplications, Abdul Muttalib and his companions, also went off to the mountains. Next morning Abraha, prepared to enter Mecca, but his special elephant, Mahmud, which was in the forefront, knelt down. It was beaten with iron bars, goaded, even scarified, but it would not get up. When they made it face south, north, or east, it would immediately start off. But as soon as they directed it towards Mecca, it knelt down. In the meantime, swarms of birds appeared carrying stones in their beaks and claws, and showered these on the troops. Whoever was hit would start disintegrating. According to Muhammad bin Ishaq, and Ikramah, this was smallpox, which was seen in Arabia for the first time in that year. Ibn Abbas says that whoever was struck by a pebble, would start scratching his body, resulting in breaking of the skin, and falling off of the flesh. In another tradition, Ibn Abbas, says that the flesh and blood, flowed like water, and bones in the body became, visible. The same thing happened with Abraha too. His flesh fell in pieces, and there arose, bores on his body, emitting pus and blood. In confusion, they withdrew, and fled towards Yemen. Nufail bin Habib, whom they had brought as guide, 
from the country of Hatham, was searched out and asked to guide them back to Yemen, but he refused and said, Now where can one flee when God pursues? The split nose Abraha is the conquered, not the conqueror. As they withdrew, they were continually falling by the bay and dying. Ada bin Yasser says that all the troops did not perish. At the spot, some perished there, and others perished by the wayside as they withdrew. Abraha died in the country of Hatham. This event took place at Mahasar, by the Mahasab Valley, between Muzdalifa and Mina. According to the Sahih of Muslim, and Abu Dawood, in the description of the Prophet's farewell pilgrimage, that Imam Jafar as Sadiq has related from his father, Imam Muhammad Bakr, and he from Jabir bin Abdullah, he says, that when the Prophet proceeded from Muzdalifa to Mina, he increased his speed in the valley of Mahasar. Imam Nawawi has explained it saying, that the incident of the people of the elephant, had occurred there, therefore, the pilgrims have been enjoined to pass by quickly, for Mahasar is a tormented place. Imam Malik and Muwata, has related that the Prophet said, that the whole of Muzdalifa, is a place fit for staying, but one should not stay in the valley of Mahasar. In the verses of Nufail bin Habib, which Ibn Ishaq has cited, he describes this event, as an eyewitness. With that you had seen, O Rudena, but you would not see what we saw, by the valley of Mahasab. I praised God when I saw the birds, and I feared, lest the stone should fall upon us. Everyone was asking for new fail, as though I owed the Abyssinians, a debt. This was such a momentous event, that it soon spread throughout Arabia, and many poets made it the subject of their laudatory poems. In these poems, one thing is quite evident, that everyone regarded it as a manifestation of God Almighty's miraculous power, and no one, even by illusion, said that the idols which were worshipped in the Kaaba, had anything to do with it. For example, Abdullah ibn Az Zibara, says, the sixty thousand returned not home, nor did their sick man, Abraha, survive on return. Ad, and Jerham, were there before them, and there is God, above the servants, who sustains it. Abu Qais bin Aslat says, Rise and worship your Lord, and anoint the corners of the house of God, between the mountains of Mecca, and Mina. When the help of the owner of the throne, reached you, his armies repulsed them, so that they were lying in dust, pelted with stones. Not only this, but according to Amhani, and Zubair bin al-Awam, the Prophet said. The Quraysh did not worship anyone, but God, the only, and one, for ten years. And according to others, for seven years. The Arabs describe the year in which this event took place as, the year of the elephants. Am. Alfil. And in the same year, the Messenger of God was born. The traditionists and historians almost unanimously state, that the event of the people of the elephant, had occurred in Muharram, and the Prophet was born in Rabi al -Oil. A majority of them state, that he was born fifty days after the event of the elephant. Theme and Substance If this surah is studied in the light of the historical details, as given above, one can fully well understand, why in this surah, only God's inflicting his punishment on the people of the elephant, has been referred, and described so briefly. It was an event of recent occurrence, and everyone in Mecca and Arabia was fully aware of it. The Arabs believed that the Kaaba had been protected in this invasion. Not by any god, or goddess, but by God Almighty himself. Then God alone had been invoked by the Quraysh chiefs for help, and for quite a few years. The people of Quraysh having been impressed by this event, had worshipped none but God. Therefore, there was no need to mention the details, but only a reference to it, was enough. So that the people of Quraysh in particular, and the people of Arabia in general, should consider well in their hearts, the message that the Prophet Muhammad was giving. For the only message that he gave, was that they should worship, and serve none but God, the only, 
and won. Then, they should also consider, that if they used force to suppress this invitation to the truth, they would only be inviting the wrath of God, who had so completely routed and destroyed, the people of the elephants. Surah 105. Alfil. Elephant. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Have you not considered O Muhammad, how your Lord dealt with the companions of the elephant? Meaning, the army under the command of, Abraha, al-Ashram, which was accompanied by a huge elephant, and came with the intention of destroying the Kaaba, at Mecca. Did he not make their plan, into misguidance? Causing them to perish. And he sent against them, birds and flocks, striking them, with stones of hard clay, and he made them, like heat and straw. Meaning, husks, which have been chewed by cattle. This event took place in the year of the Prophet's birth. Thank you, for listening. If you have enjoyed listening to this book, please give it a like, and consider subscribing to the channel, and click the notifications button, so you don't miss out, on any other videos.